evening and welcome uh, everybody to the 17th in the series of Great Minds, Great Lives lectures organised uh, by the University of Buckingham uh, and open and free to, to all uh, listeners. Welcome to all of you. Um, many uh, uh, philosophers of all different ages, Philosophers Foundation, uh, people across um, uh, across the country and indeed beyond. Um, the audience tonight will be uh, significantly over a thousand. Uh, do have your questions ready and I will pick uh, questions that um, obviously listen to the talk uh, but have them uh, ready uh, during the talk. If you have a, a name and can make the question as short as possible because it's easier then to get through as many as possible. Um, to say to all of you uh, that um, it's really wonderful to, to have you here. Uh, a big difference uh, with uh, listening to Julian talking um, a, at a literary festival or a philosophy lecture is that we can see inside his room. So on the series, uh, we often begin just by asking the writer, the thinker to comment uh, about uh, the room in which they're being filmed and is this the room where they think and write? So Julian, first question to you before you begin your talk tonight to us. Thanks Anthony, it's lovely to be able to do this talk. Well this room actually is usually my other half's room, um, but I often work in a glorified shed in the garden, but um, I, I do sometimes use it myself and it's a bit better closer to the Wi-Fi, so it's the place to, to be if I want to do anything remotely. And do you do your your writing and thinking always in front of a, a computer or are you uh, thinking, uh, uh, do the ideas come when you're walking about? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think it's very important to, to do different things, do different activities. Um, there's a very good book actually, I think the author's Madison Curry um, called, I can't remember what it's called now, and it's about the habits of artists, creators and thinkers. And what's so interesting is actually if you look at the number of hours of the day they spend directly doing what they're supposed to be doing, it's the average is about I'd say three to five mm -hmm. and almost all of them do things like go for a walk, do something to break things up. And I think we all know that's how things work, you have to let things stew. In, in the back of your mind. So so definitely a, mi a mixed life is, is is very important, I think, if you want to be able to think well. Absolutely fascinating. Well, uh, uh, enough uh, and let uh, your tonight's talk, Julian, commence. Thanks, Anthony. So I, I, I chose a kind of title Global Philosophy at a Time of Global Crisis because I was going to speak about global philosophy, which is interesting for me because you know, I've been in philosophy all my adult life, but until very recently, that was 99% Western philosophy, which is entirely typical for anybody who is doing philosophy in the Western environment, that the subject is almost defined in terms of that tradition. And it just did strike me, I have been struck many times during this crisis, that actually global thought, having a more of an awareness of non-Western traditions of philosophy, is actually quite an important thing because philosophy is both uh, it shapes culture it reflects culture there's a kind of a two-way interaction that goes there and so when you look at the philosophy associated with any great culture you are in a sense getting a window into how ordinary people think in that culture too these things don't exist in complete isolation so i mean i've got a few images here to show you just of, of the to illustrate the situation we're in um, so we have Wuhan, where the coronavirus crisis began, the empty streets there. And we also have the Black Lives Matter campaign, uh, obviously after the death of George Floyd. And um, we also have the Colston statue in Bristol. I live in Bristol and uh, I, I've passed that statue many a time. And there's been many debates in the city about the legacy of Colston and the name. And only a few weeks ago, people took it into their own hands. The statue came down, went into the river. And I think what you see in those kind of first three pictures, really, are indications of, first of all, that we live in such an interconnected world. 
that we are an international society. Viruses spread, of course they do. But that's only because everything else spreads too. We're so interconnected. And then these also these issues about what that kind of interconnectedness means and what it means to understand our history, particularly when it comes to diversity and the challenge to particularly, I think, Western cultures to broaden their horizons beyond the traditional you know, dead white male curriculum, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, later. The fourth picture, of course, is a uh, reaction to that, America first and Donald Trump. And there is, I think, uh, I think a danger, I, I would put it in those negative terms, that this global crisis, rather than bringing us together, could push us further apart. There'll be more uh, localism, more defense of national interests, and actually a retreat from the international. And I think that'd be a mistake. So what I want to do really in the short time I have here is to try and make a case for why, actually, if we're going to think our way through, not just the problems of now, but of the, of the next few years, then what we really need to do is to, well, it'd be very useful as part of what we do, at least, to think about uh, global philosophy, non-Western philosophy. Now, comparative philosophy is the name given to a study of more than one tradition. And before I begin, I, there, it is such a difficult thing to do. And I've identified these three deadly sins associated with it. Uh, the first is what I'd call domesticating. Uh, this is where you, you scan your eye over ideas and thinkers from other parts of the world, other traditions you're not familiar with. And you basically go, oh, yes, I know that's their version of what we already have. So in other words, it's kind of not taking seriously the idea that there might be genuinely original and different and interesting ways of thinking in other cultures to see them all through the sort of translating lens of your own culture and to therefore miss out on what could be genuinely new and informative. But there's an equal and opposite mistake, which is exoticizing. And this is where people treat other cultures than their own as though they were somehow often in a very, I suppose, positive way as being so different, so exotic, so wonderful that it's almost like we can't learn anything from them. Uh, I think you often hear this, uh, this cliche I often hear is that people say that Indians are such a spiritual people. And to a certain extent, I can see what people mean by that if they mean that spiritual and religious matters are typically more at the heart of daily life in India than they are in the West. That's true. But the but sometimes it almost sounds as though Indians are kind of a separate sort of species attuned to a higher plane and not really concerned with with material matters, which is clearly absurd. So it's about sort of negotiating those between those two equal and opposite mistakes, taking difference seriously, but never exaggerating it. And the third mistake is what I call essentializing. This is where one kind of believes that there is a Chinese way of thinking, an Indian way of thinking, a Western way of thinking, and not to acknowledge the diversity within those traditions. Now, this is it's very difficult when we're talking broad brushes about Chinese thought, Indian thought, Western thought. It is indeed possible to make generalizations, but it's very important that those generalizations do not go over the top and do not become essentializing. So to, to give a, a simple example of the difference, everyone knows what it means to say that uh, men are taller than women. Uh, as a generalization, that's about averages, and it's perfectly true. If you were to think it meant that all men are taller than all women, of course it would be absurd. So you can say things about tendencies in different philosophical traditions, but you've always got to be on your guard to remember that that doesn't mean you're describing everyone, every thinker within that tradition. Now, the most important thing, actually, I, I think to bear in mind when thinking about non traditions other than your own, is captured in this quote from, from Tom Kasulis, which is actually probably the most useful thing that I came across when I was doing my own uh, study into comparative philosophy for my book. Um, what is foreground in one culture may be background in another. It sounds like a very simple statement, an obvious one either, even, but it means something quite significant. I think we tend to think in terms of dichotomies, so we tend to think that, for example, the, the, the West is individualist and the East is collectivist, that the West is materialist, the East is spiritual. And there are other sort of dichotomies like this. 
Now, Cassoulis's point is really that's always a mistake. Rather, what you see is that there's very, very little, perhaps nothing, which is entirely unique to one culture and entirely absent in another. But it is certainly true that at different times and in different places, different things get put in the foreground and other things go into the background. And that's so important, I think, for learning from other cultures, because what it does is when you look at comparative philosophy and if you were to look at other co comparative cultures in any other way too, the way you learn is not trying to borrow some completely alien idea and to sort of import it into soil where it won't grow. It can be a way of making you attend to what is perhaps too much in the background in your own tradition or what is too much in the foreground and help us towards potentially some kind of rebalancing. So I'm going to give just a little example of that in here, if I may, which my next set of pictures is going to um, give us some illustration of. Now, I mentioned before how there's this stereotype that the East is collectivist and the West is individualist. And I think that getting this right and seeing why there's something a bit wrong about that is really, really important. And I particularly found this uh, in Japan and in studying Japanese uh, literature but it's, and philosophy, but it's also something I think you see all across East Asia. So the first picture I have here is a, a very famous shopping district in Tokyo. And if, I was, if this was to be a video, you would see you know, everybody waiting by the crossroads, the lights changing, the people crossing the roads in what seems to be a remarkably orderly fashion. And from a vantage point like this, it kind of looks like you know, crowd behaviour. It looks like it's an exemplification of that collectivist sort of mentality in which the individual is lost in the group. Now, I actually think that is a mistake. Most of the people who discuss and analyse both in philosophy and in culture attitudes towards self and identity comparatively, don't really use the word collectivist so much when talking about the Far East. The word they would use is more what are called relational. Now this is really important. The idea here is that in the East your own individual identity is not really separable from the context with which it is found. So that the society, the family, the group, the school. It's not that there aren't individuals, they very much are individuals, but that what it means to be that individual isn't separable from your connections to others. And there's a lot more sensitivity to those relations in everyday encounters. So for example, the way in which you address another person, uh, the, the words you use will change depending upon what your relationship to them is. So this is a relational view of things and it contrasts with what I call the more atomistic view which is developed in the West. And yes, yeah, it's got a long history. I think a lot of people would agree that it's become more accentuated in recent decades. This is where the primacy is put on the individual. In the sense, the individual comes first and the relations to others come second. And that manifests itself also politically and morally. So you have your duties, you have your responsibilities as an individual and you have your rights. Your rights are as an individual. And they're not really, they're not overtly dependent upon any relation to anything else. If people viewing this in the, United, in the UK um, and who aren't too young may remember that when Tony Blair became uh, prime minister in the end, he was campaigning in those elections, they had this slogan, no rights without responsibilities. And this was trying to kind of counter that highly individualistic view where, you have your rights as an individual and that's the end of the contract. There's nothing you have to do in return. And what's quite interesting about that slogan, of course, is that it had to exist at all. I think there are many other parts of the world where the relational aspect of being a person is so obvious that no one would ever think you could possibly have rights without responsibilities because the relationality, as it were, comes first. The individuality comes second. I think this is a a very important way to understand different ways of thinking in, in the Far East. The, the, the sign I have was from the Tokyo subway to the top right there. And I, I would really love this sign or a version of it to be put all over British public transport. Any masterpiece just becomes noise disturbance when emanating from earphones, it says. 
And the point there is now I know there are signs in Japan which tell you what to do. So I'm not saying there aren't ever um, those kind of do this, do that signs. But what's interesting about this sign is it doesn't contain a command. What it's doing is it's reminding passengers on public transport that if noise leaks from their headphones, it's a disturbance to other people. And in a culture in which people are much more sensitive of that relational aspect of the fact they relate to others, it really does seem to be enough. That reminder enough is an, it will curb people's behaviour. If you go on the t uh, Tokyo subway or any public transport, you find people very, very respectful of the space of others, even when the public transport is really, really busy. Whereas, unfortunately, I think in places like Britain and in the United States, it's rather the opposite. People seem to be like competing and defending their own personal space. You may remember that in a New York subway a few years ago, they had to put some signs up uh, warning people against what was called manspreading, which was the, the practice of sitting on a seat with your legs wide apart, stopping other people from sitting next to you. Now, again, the crucial point I want to emphasize here is that it's not that people in Japan have a completely different sense of what it means to be a human being to people in London or New York. It goes back to that Kasulis point. It's about what is emphasized, what is at the forefront. If I could just go back to the previous pictures, actually, because I haven't quite uh, finished with those. Um, and so uh, things can be understood in, in many ways. I think this picture of the selfies is very interesting because a lot of people would say that when we talk about cultures like Japan and East Asia being much more relational, concerned with others, that's romantic and false because these days everyone in, around the world has embraced individualism. And you might think that people taking selfies of themselves, you know, is, is proof of this. Well, actually, not necessarily at all. The selfie has two different functions where individuality and identity is, is foregrounded. It's about self-presentation. It's about look at me. But actually, in cultures which are relational, it's not about that at all. It's about I want you to share this moment with me, even though you're not here with me. So I think that that's an interesting sort of difference on the same aspect there. So why is this important? Why is it interesting? Well, I do think that there has been there have been different responses to the COVID crisis. Uh, and which have clearly been informed by these deep rooted cultural beliefs. I mean, I've talked about the relational self and the atomistic self almost as like a sociologist or an anthropologist, but these have their roots in the philosophical traditions of these countries. You can you can look at uh, the, the way the self is conceptualized philosophically and you will see the, these patterns there. And I, I think that the trick we miss is that we in the West, I'm saying we in the West, often tend to assume that our individualism is kind of can't be challenged in any way because the alternative is a collectivism in which the individual is lost. And I think when you think about the alternative to the, this atomization, not being collectivism, but a greater sensitivity to the relational, you can actually see that this is not there is no potential loss here. There may or well, the loss is not what we would think it to be. And then actually, if we then look around at our own culture and we think, again, foreground, background, it's not like we've lost all sense of the relational. In fact, one of the wonderful, I think, discoveries of the lockdowns in many Western countries is that it is proven the point that people who believed that we had become a totally selfish, isolated, egotistical culture were wrong. People have been very quick to help others. Uh, the, the crisis has, as it were, made them value those relations even more. And I think it would be a, a good thing if we could take this as an opportunity to see that this is part of a broader problem. This isn't just the way we should respond to a crisis, that we have the opportunity, if we like, to, to, to steer away from that excessive atomization and individualization and try rather instead to gain a greater sense of our relationality to others. And I actually think that there are times where almost paradoxically, the when you give more to the relational, you actually can become more of an individual. If I can give a, I mean, so for instance, uh, there was a great, there's a film I saw flying out of Japan. It's actually a teenage film. And what was so interesting about that was it, it was a romance in which the romantic couple were very rarely on the screen by themselves. And the whole story was contextualized around a friendship group 
and a broader kinship group of family and so forth. But those, those characters were nonetheless very, very distinctive individuals. It was like within that relational arrangement, their individuality could come through. And I think the best metaphor for this is, is a jazz band, actually. If you think about a jazz band, a jazz band requires a collection of people. There's very little solo jazz. There's some, but very little. Most of it is in the band. But of course, it's in the band that people get to express their individuality the most. They require the relationality of the group in order to be more uh, themselves. And I think that the, the trick that's kind of been missed in, in Western culture is that we've believed, we've made the mistake of thinking that in order to be the maximally individual, we have to kind of become maxim, maxim, maximally autonomous. We have to be uh, as self-sufficient as possible. And I think that misunderstands human nature and it actually misunderstands what it means to be a self. So that's just a little outline of something I think that is very useful. We can we can pick up from attending to uh, other traditions of thought. I'm going to just move on to another now, which I think is, is interesting. This is a particular idea that comes from Chinese philosophy, particularly Confucianism. The sign on the top left, you can't read very well because it was taken out of a moving taxi when I arrived in Chufu, which was the birthplace of Confucius. Chufu is one of those cities in China which is just being massively expanded. It was a little backwater for, for centuries really, and now it's just growing into this huge city with a high-speed train running through it. And there's a massive, massive housing development. And there on the advertising boards for this housing development, was the slogan, live in Confucianism, life is harmony. I thought that was very interesting and I have this challenge, which is if someone can show me a housing development in, in Britain or America, maybe, maybe other European countries too, which uses a philosopher's words in order to try and sell it, then I'd be very, very surprised. Um, that This in itself shows you the depth of the Confucian culture in China. But this thing, life is harmony. If you, anyone who's studied Chinese society or philosophy, even at the most elementary level, will appreciate that harmony is the key social, political and ethical value. We have here things like the uh, gate of supreme harmony in the temple of Confucius and so forth. Uh, and and there, there are various halls of harmony in the forbidden city. The word is ubiquitous in official pronouncements, government documents and so forth. So what is this thing called harmony and why is it so important? And, and by the way, I would say that I think that harmony is as central to the Chinese conception of the good and ethical life as ideas of liberty and freedom are to the modern Western imagination. I think people are suspicious of this though, because the, the image of China, of course, is in its past as a very hierarchical society and in its present, a very uh, authoritarian one. And the harmony really means know your place and keep your place. So the picture in the bottom left is of a couple overlooking the Forbidden City, but actually to be a commoner in that position in various times of history would itself have been a death sentence because harmony required people sticking to their place in the social order and they weren't even allowed to look at the Forbidden City. Well, if harmony meant simply that it wouldn't be, it would be interesting to know about to help to understand the Chinese way of thinking, but it would not be something to learn from. But I think it is something to learn from because Actually, in the classical Confucian tradition, harmony certainly doesn't mean just pure obedience and it doesn't mean sameness. So one of the most famous metaphors and images for explaining what harmony means is that of a soup. And I have an example of one to the side here, which is assorted meats and organs, congee. Um, a soup manifests harmony not when it has just a single ingredient, and that's a very boring bland soup. It manifests harmony when it has a combination of different elements, the broth, the vegetables, the herbs, the spices, the meat and so forth. And it's in the combining of them that you get the harmony. And not surprisingly, the other great image to explain this is a musical one as well. You don't get 
harmony in, in music. We don't get a beautiful piece of music by one instrument playing one note or 10 of the same instruments playing the same 10 notes. It's different instruments playing different lines of music which all come together. Now, this sort of ideal of harmony, it's true that in traditional Chinese society is very much maintained in a very strict way, uh, particularly family relations and ruler uh, subject relations. But that's not inevitable. And even in the ancient tradition, it certainly was not suggested that people should be blindly obedient. So, for example, a son had a duty to remonstrate with his father if he saw his father doing wrong, for instance. And similarly, in the if you read the Analects of Confucius, uh, there are many times where it's, it's made clear that it's the duty of the, the advisor to challenge the ruler if necessary. But the point about harmony being so important is that it's actually a way of thinking about the solution to the fundamental problem of a harmonious society, which is that a society contains difference and you have to manage that difference in some way. Now, I think that in the individualistic Western society in which we've just seen democracy as the easy solution to that problem, we're encountering problems with it. It's not really working because what you have in a democracy are the problems that were foreseen by people like Aristotle and Plato who were perhaps too dismissive of democracy but nonetheless saw real dangers, which is that you can't, if you have a situation where it's simply the majority wins and the minority lose, that creates a divided society. And in many of our Western democracies now, we're seeing this kind of division in a really serious way. We're seeing big cultural wars. So um, in the UK, for example, people talk about the difference between uh, particularly the, the more educated city dwellers and people who live in smaller towns in the countryside. There seems to be a very, very big divide in opinions and values. And in America, the polarization between the red states and the blue states seems to be stronger than ever. And this is an inherent problem of democracy. And the, the, the problem becomes larger, I think, because people have expected that their rights as autonomous individuals and citizens and consumers is to get what they want. And of course, that's not, it's never possible for everyone in a society to get what they want, they need to have compromise. So the value of harmony, now the point is, it doesn't exist. It's not a, it's not a concept. If you study political philosophy, or political science in a Western university, no one will ever use the word harmony. Now, of course, that's not because we don't value it. It's Again, it's there in the background. Once you start to articulate what it means, everyone gets that it's a good idea to have this harmonious society, and it does require the, the careful managing of difference. Um, what the Confucian tradition gives us is a, is a way of conceptualizing that and thinking about it as something which we might be able to put more in the foreground and think about as a means of trying to resolve a lot of the real problems around division uh, that we have. And if we go back to issues around uh, diversity, Black Lives Matter and so forth, I think that there are certain solutions to that which don't work because they're based on re-emphasizing the differences between people, the kind of identity politics, the kind of identity politics which basically becomes a kind of zero-sum game. It's one group against another. I'm not saying all identity politics is like that. It seems that the only solution really you can have for a society in which there are diverse groups with diverse interests is not to sort of like let the majority win and nor is it actually simply to sort of like divide and rule or to sort of like segment society up but to try and find that way of harmonizing society uh, and in the way in which you get a good soup or a good music, a good piece of music does. And that's a challenge. And I think one of, the, one of the good things about these analogies is if you think about great music, good cooking, there's a kind of a skill there. There's not really an algorithm for it. Sure, you've got a musical score and you've got recipes, but to create these things in the first place requires a kind of imagination which um, goes beyond the merely procedural. So I think with these ideas of harmony and the relational self, I think we have ways in which I hope illustrate thinking about non-Western traditions of philosophy is actually extremely informative, not just helping us to understand cultures different from our own, but ways of turning the, the, the mirror as we're on ourselves and seeing where some of our problems might lie and what some of the solutions might be.
Now, the last thing I want to talk about very briefly, and I'll move on to the next set of pictures for this, is this issue I alluded to earlier. Uh, people talk about this decolonizing of the curriculum, the idea that with the Black Lives Matters movement, uh, what it's really illustrating is a is a deep need for a to deeply challenge the standard curriculums and what we teach in in our universities to reflect better the diversity, not just within our own societies, but I think internationally. And I think these things can't really be separated. Sometimes these seem like entirely national issues, but I think that you know the marginalisation of other cultures is deeply connected with the marginalization of minority groups within a culture and i think that once you start to look at this whatever your instincts may be about wanting to defend the great traditions of shakespeare and so forth in our in our schools and universities it becomes patently obvious very quickly that there's something deeply wrong about the way we teach so here's a simple illustration of this i've got three pictures here we have this uh the Indian Machiavelli is often called this Chanakya or Kautilya, who is 375 to 283 BCE. And he's called the Indian Machiavelli. There's also a Persian Machiavelli, Nizam al Muluk. He was 1018 to 1092 CE. Machiavelli, not the European Machiavelli, Nicola Machiavelli, came, of course, long after both of these. But this is the sort of, it's both the ignorance of people from non Western cultures who were. Uh, equally interesting, equally important, and had similar, but importantly, different ideas. Um, not only are we not aware of them, when we are aware of them, we call them the Indian Machiavelli or the Persian Machiavelli, because we're seeing things entirely through the primacy of our own culture. I think that is a problem which we need to wake up to. And there was a very interesting article, which um, I've got a little picture of here in the New York Times many years ago, from Jay Garfield and Brian Van Norden. These two have been arguing for a very long time that philosophy should diversify its curriculum. And they wrote this piece in the New York Times uh, Stone blog, which had got a lot of attention because in a way they, they sort of gave up. What they said was, OK, don't diversify your curriculum, but at the very least have the honesty to call your curriculum Western philosophy. Don't leave out the Western. If you're only going to teach Western philosophy, call it Western philosophy. And this sparked a big debate, and I think it is leading to change. Van Norden wrote a book, uh, Taking Back Philosophy, uh, really on the back of this. And he really addresses all those issues. He, he addresses very well, I think, the objections people have against this idea that we ought to diversify our curriculum. Some people say it's just not philosophy. They say, look, philosophy is this tradition of thought which goes back to ancient Greece. Like it or not, it's the Western tradition. And so fine, I respect what we call Chinese Indian philosophy, but let's not pretend they're philosophy in our sense of the word. Well, I think this is just doesn't stand up. And someone like Van Norden, if you read his book, will show this because there's too much overlap in the issues which are of concern to these philosophers in different traditions. And also there's too much uh, overlap in the sort of methods and approaches they use to them. So dismissing it as not just not philosophy is, is essentially ignorant, so, as is the view that it's just not good enough. It's remarkable how many people will say that, look, you know, these works of Confucius and all these great thinkers in, in India uh, just aren't very good at philosophy. It's all sort of it's aphorisms and mythology and that really shows a lack of careful reading i think that when people do sit down and study these things properly they soon are disabused of that they might say it's theology that's another objection particularly against indian philosophy but again there's a sort of historical failure in that criticism because if you were to look at most of western philosophy in the modern era almost all the great philosophers until fairly recently in, in relative terms were not just overtly Christian, but their Christianity clearly informed their thinking. Descartes would not have been the philosopher he was were he not a Christian. So I just think that part of the problem here is it both overestimates the extent to which Indian philosophy in particular is entwined with religion and understates the extent to which Western thought has been intertwined with Christianity. And as an objection against Chinese philosophy, it just doesn't wash because actually Confucianism isn't a religion. The final objection really is well, we can't do everything that it's in theory, it'd be wonderful to broaden the curriculum, 
but you know it's it's difficult enough covering the key topics in Western philosophy without going further than that. And again, that's a, I think a weak objection because as the objection itself acknowledges, you don't cover everything anyway. You're always selective. So why be selective systematically against non-Western philosophy? Why not at least have some of it in the curriculum? So I think that I, the, the term decolonizing the curriculum is one that uh, I can see why people use it. And sometimes it is specifically about that decolonizing. But in a way, I wouldn't like that to become the main slogan because I think it's misleading. It's not actually about the colonial mindset as such. It's simply a rather disinterest in cultures other than your own. And I think that's deeply unhelpful and unhealthy in any intellectual tradition. So I think that hopefully I've sort of sketched out a case here, and it is only a sketch, of why we should be looking beyond our own traditions and why that's actually not only important we can the current crisis i think has provided some illustrations of why that's useful and important but it's going to be important way beyond that too thanks very much thank you julian uh, very much indeed for that wonderful uh, overview and uh, extraordinarily refreshing uh, it is to have that too a reminder the questions uh, do please uh, pile the questions in I very much like to have them. And just uh, while you're doing that, just a few quick questions coming through to Julian. Um, when I studied philosophy as part of my degree, um, I, I then um, left and came down back to, to London to write a doctorate and started meditating Julian uh, with a, a Hindu Sanskrit mantra. And I found that infinitely more uh, enriching and stimulating than the arid linguistic philosophy uh, which I studied and was made to feel very unintellectual for raising that um, and so when did uh, this, uh, who were the early forerunners of, of, of you um, and when did you yourself start to recognise that maybe the West's obsessive obsession with its own uh, naval, um, uh, 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 and that might be going too far for you, um, uh, is not enough and, and there should be a, a more of an open interest in other philosophers. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I have to say, you know, one, no one likes to think they have a closed mind and I did make some early attempts. I mean, I started a philosophy magazine, the Philosophers magazine back in 1997, and we were very open to the idea of having non-Western philosophy. But we did find it difficult to do. And I think one has to appreciate that when you're not familiar with a tradition and you're just presented with something, it can seem strange and difficult and not the kind of thing you do. But of course, at the same time, why should that be surprising? If, if someone who is not familiar with Western analytic philosophy picked up a paper by, say, a Donald Davidson, they would be completely baffled too and might suspect it of being sophistry or or whatever. So I did have a go. But what persuaded me actually, I think, uh, really got me converted was that you, you, you probably do know Nicholas Berggruen, who's launched his Berggruen Institute. He's been going in various forms for quite a long time and he's trying to promote global understanding and culture. And he organised a number of different workshops, which I was lucky enough to attend. And it's, it's really, it's that, it's that close encounter when you, you, you're around a table with people from different traditions and you can just see that they have interesting things to say on the same subjects that you've been interested in coming from a different angle. And I think that really fired up, that's what really fired up my interest and made me think that in a sense I'd run out of excuses for being so ignorant of all these other traditions. So last night's speaker, Julian, some of you will have been listening in, was Julia Samuel, who is um, the leading, a leading bereavement uh, therapist, counsellor, wrote Grief Works amongst uh, uh, other books. And uh, she said, look, there isn't one self. We are a collection of, of different people. We're different people with different others and in different situations. So uh, my own experience, uh, having meditated for 40 years, is that there is just one uh, self, uh, which is the Atman, which is not in fact 
um, uh, individual. Uh, it is uh, a universal sense, which and it also resides outside time. Now, you can't think your way into that. You can only get there by doing it. Um, so can you talk about the difference between knowing uh, that, uh, that there was a specialist in, in Western Buddhist philosophy at Sussex I spoke to a lot. She knew an awful lot about the practice of Western Buddhism, but she never, and I asked her once, had she practiced Buddhism? Had she been on silent retreat? She said, oh, no, no, not in your life. No, that's not, that's not for me. Uh, what, what's going on there? Yeah, no, that, well, that is an interesting one. I mean, the self is a subject I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by, and I am more inclined to the view of there being no unified self. Uh, so more the Buddhist view, um, which is also the view of David Hume, actually. So you have the Buddhist view and the Humean view coming to the same conclusion, seemingly from totally independent means. Um, I think experience is very important. I think that what isn't overlooked in even in Western philosophy is that I think that in Western philosophy's self-image is that it's about argumentation and rational deduction in particular and of course that does have an important place in philosophy but if you actually look through the canonical texts themselves uh, even contemporary ones I think that what's even more important than that is what I just call attending actually it's very careful attention so someone like Descartes when Descartes concluded that he had this indivisible self it was based I think on a mistaken but it was an observation it was an observation that if he if he attended carefully to what he could achieve by doubting he could not doubt he existed and it wasn't an argument I mean unfortunately people say cogito ergo sum which is how it is phrased in, in one of his books but in the meditations it's simply the observation I am I think and I cannot deny that and similarly Hume's rebuttal of that was not an argument it was based on observation it's what do you see when you turn the gaze inwards and have a look so I do think that attending is very very important where I am um, find this problematic though is that having a certain kind of experience I'm very wary of allowing that to have authority because the way things seem isn't necessarily the way things are and I think this is particularly important if we're talking about heightened experiences um, so experiencing a oneness with the universe for example I really don't know how on earth one would know whether that was just the way it seemed to you or you having an insight to the way reality is so I think you need some independent justification for that so I think the thing about the human view and the Buddhist view is I think we do have independent we, 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 we notice this by attending but then we look at the way the mind works the brain works I think we have independent verification of it I'm not personally yet convinced you might persuade me over time that we have any independent um, uh, validation for the view of a kind of the, the Atman of the single universal consciousness. So uh, taking that that on, Iris Murdoch in um, her last work, uh, The Sovereignty of Good, talks about precisely the point, Julian, there about the importance of attending mm. a, and being there in the present moment. She picks up on T.S. Eliot uh, and the, the, the point of the present. Uh, and yet you know, she was rather scorned um, and just to mention another speaker two or three weeks ago, Julian, a, a doctor who uh, talks about harmony uh, mm -hmm. a lot and uses harmony. Um, he was he was gynecologist for the British Olympic team and believes in the natural harmony of the body and is regularly dismissed mm -hmm. by the medical establishment for whom that uh, logical, uh, Cartesian thinking, empirical view um, uh, it has has little truck uh, with this sense of bodily harmony, which mm. he sees as the fundamental building block of the healthy body and the healthy mind. Yeah, I mean, I think I, yeah, okay, I think that's true. But I think what's interesting there is those arguments are one. I mean, I think that the resistance to different ways of thinking is is widespread. I mean, it's universal and I don't think it's a particularly Western fault either, to be honest. I think if you're rooted in a particular way of thinking, you, you're not going to, go to change unless you're persuaded otherwise. But I think that it, rather than sort of banging heads against a wall and saying, you know, look, you've just got to accept a totally different paradigm. I think that a lot of 
the sort of things you're talking about there, the way to shift people towards them is to get them to recognize that even by their own criteria, this is the way you have to go. So, for example, this relationality. So I contrasted the atomistic view with the relational view, and I did that in the context of the self. But of course, it's something which goes across all spheres. So that in science, for example, you know, we have prioritized the reductive atomistic view. The, the, the scientific paradigm has been for a long time. We want to understand how things work, break things down to their smallest elements, see how they work, build up from there, bingo. It was very successful. And I think the success made people complacent. Now, where are the real growth areas in the natural sciences? And it's and without being an expert on this, it seems to me that it's very clear the growth areas are precisely in those fields which have seen the limits of that reductive approach and are looking at systems and interrelations and emergent properties. So I think that, you know, you can you, you have to sort of lead people in different directions from where they are with 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 ideas that they can they can themselves follow rather than get into a you know your whole paradigm is wrong kind of thing. <laughs> people never like admitting that they can, can conceivably be wrong let's come over to questions for the last 15 minutes uh, and mark says um uh, can you tell us about your website where we can learn more about your your thinking julian oh well good advert yes okay so microphilosophy.net i rather re not sure it's the best name for it, but I'm stuck with it now. Uh, basically, this contains links to all the books and articles and things things I write. So microphilosophy.net. Uh, next question. I'm trying to prioritise student questions. It's a bit difficult to tell sometimes. Um, has Can you say any other way that COVID, your response to it, has changed your thinking, maybe giving you more time to, to actually think? Uh, does thinking take time, need time? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. Well, actually, I've got to, if I can be a bit autobiographical here. Um, before COVID, well, before COVID became the big thing, I was hospitalised with pneumonia. This was in February and I was even in an ICU intensive care unit for a few days, although mercifully not having to be on a ventilator. Um, I still don't know if I had COVID. I rather suspect I did, but it's not been tested. And so I kind of like was a bit ahead of the curve here, really. So out of hospital, I was still kind of in isolation, not seeing things. It's just kind of continued. And I do think that it, it did affect me. It did make me. It, it, I think it's become a bit of a cliche that people say it's got them focusing on what matters most matters in their life. And but I think I think it has done. And I, I think for me, time, the time to think is so important. And I, I think that like a lot of people, I've allowed myself to live in too hurried a manner and not given myself the time that's needed to really think. Because as we were saying right at the beginning of the talk, actually to think effectively, you need time where you're doing nothing in particular or you're doing something that's not intellectual. You're just going for a walk or whatever it is, or you're chopping vegetables, whatever it might be. Again, that yeah, kind of Hume talked about the mixed kind of life. He called it as being the most appropriate for a human being, not all work, not all study. So I think it has really um, it has really put that into focus for me. Uh, I'm sceptical of myself and other people, though, in the sense that I know how easy it is to slide back into old habits once things resume. So it's going to take an effort to keep this going. It's quite simple at the moment because I can just turn down travel invitations well, they're not happening, but, you know, there'll come a point where people will ask me to start traveling again to do things. And I have to be much, much more careful before I say yes. Interesting. Uh, Davina says, hello, Julian. Um, you've spoken about uh, rela relationality uh, and collectivity. Do you think technology is helpful or not in this uh, regard? And then she's referring you to Martin Heidegger's ideas on technology and human relationship. I don't know whether you want to just uh, contextualise uh, their uh, Heidegger's thinking. I'm very, I'm very reluctant to extemporise on, on Heidegger, who I don't understand <laughs> very well, but I think his work on technology is very interesting. He, he does write very interestingly about our relationship to tools and the way in which actually we can become kind of one with them, you know, the, the, the big part of our of our being, which is which is, which is very interesting and, and anticipates certain ideas which have become um, more popular. Does technology help help or hinder? I mean, it obviously can 
do both. I mean, we're doing this now. We're doing this over uh, over Zoom, and uh, before the crisis, it was very much seen as second best, and and maybe it still is second best, but it also has certain advantages. So, for example, I think question and answer is very interesting. In a room, mm. who gets to ask the question? It's usually the people who are the most who bold, uh, the people who shove their hand up uh, highest, keep it there. Other people are probably sitting there with much, much more interesting questions because often the people who go up first will actually just want to have their little speech themselves. Um, this can be quite democratising. Everyone puts in their questions and you're scanning them and you're picking out the ones that are most interesting. Whereas with the hands, you don't know whether it's going to be the most interesting question of the evening or a monologue. Um, so I think we're, we're, we're learning. I do think in general, when we talk about social media, online life, et cetera, et cetera, and there are many people who are very doomsayers about this. And I think they underestimate the extent to which this is still so, so new. I mean, I know some younger people might not get that because they've grown up with it. But as a society, this is really, really new. You know, I'm not ancient, but when I was young, if I wanted to speak to my girlfriend at school, I had to walk to the end of the road and put coins into a phone box and I'd get five minutes if I was lucky because it was so expensive, you know, and now we're hyper connected. So I think that it's rather than I think too many people are too trying to sort of say, is social media, is technology good, bad, blah, blah, rather than asking the more important question or useful question, which is how can we how can we use it in a way that's helpful and how can we avoid using it in a way that isn't? I should just say that Julian is a philosopher on the Institute for the Ethics of AI in Education and comes in with these very profound comments uh, and he's not putting his hand up saying as saying, uh, <laughs> the way that uh, uh, that students can. Karen says um, uh, OK, so you, uh, you're one of the best known philosophers, but do you think you're a great philosopher? And if not, will you become a great philosopher? <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm not. I mean, I think that um, it's very nice of her to say that, but I, I, I think, you know, you have to sort of know your own strengths and know your own own weaknesses. Mm. And I, I don't think I have that factor X, which is that capacity to just, you know, have blinding original insights but what i think i can do quite well um is, is is make connections between things and apply them and and show where they're most useful and i think that's you know and I, that, that in a way i'm sounding modest because i'm saying i'm not a great philosopher but i think that's actually an important job too so if i can do that well I, I'm, I'm rather praising myself and i think that again our culture our educational system isn't very good at rewarding that i mean i think you know universities as well as having uh, the the narrow specialists, narrow specialists get a bad name. They're very important. But why don't they also have a large number of what you might call synoptic academics who, who's, whose job is actually not to have a single original idea in their whole life, <laughs> but to join the dots? Because at the moment, you know, we have lots of brilliant dots and hardly anyone joining them and hardly anyone capable of joining them because their training is all about um, the study and creation of dots. So, um, yeah, I'm an explainer and a synthesizer and an applier. I, and that means that I will never go down in history as one of the great philosophers. Well, Luke, in a very harmonious way there, Julian, is picking up and saying, how would you like to be remembered uh, as a philosopher, uh, as an author or um, a, as a great communicator? So that's oh, kind right. of how long has he been remembered? This makes me feel like I'm on the verge of a... Uh, does, he, does he know something about oh, my... Oh, obviously, I uh, was <laughs> thinking of, uh, of your being in the ICU there back in February. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, yeah. I mean, I, I actually don't genuinely don't think too much about that. I'm not too worried about how, how I'll be remembered. I, I think that it's vanity. It's vanity to believe I'll be remembered uh, for any length of time by anyone other than the people I most knew. I love. So, I mean, uh, if I think about how I like to be remembered, I think about how I like to be remembered by people who really, really knew me. And I like to be remembered as a, as a, as a decent human being, really. And I think that's our primary challenge. Um, it's, it's, it's quite it's more difficult to be one than, than we assume. We all think we're decent human beings, but it's, it's a bit of an effort. Question picking up on last night. Um, uh, the speaker, Julia Samuel, said, uh, no one ever dies, they always live on. Um, in what sense do, does somebody live on? There are quite a few questions now coming towards the end. 
Oh, well, that's a very good question, because, again, if we go back, we talk about this, the sort of Hume view of the self as being somewhat uh, a bundle of sensations and ideas that we don't have this unified sense. Yeah. I think that that view of this on that view of the self, you can, it kind of makes sense of the idea we have of how we actually do overlap with others. The, the people you're close to. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it interesting that as a figure of speech, when someone dies who you're very close to, people will say, I, I've lo I feel like I've lost a piece of me. Yeah. And we take that to be a, a beautiful metaphor. But actually, I think we should take it a bit more literally. You know, we are not as contained within our own bodies as we think. We, who we are is deeply connected with other people. And it's therefore true that we do live on in that sense in other people and other people live on in us. And um, uh, question there about Wittgenstein. If Wittgenstein was the greatest British philosopher of the 20th century, uh, what did he actually say? What's changed because of Wittgenstein? Oh, well, Wittgenstein. Uh, not British, I mean, uh, European philosopher. OK, well, this this is this is this is a different one for two minutes, isn't it? I do. I do rate Wittgenstein. Less than that, you've got about one minute on that one. Yeah. Wittgenstein is a very divisive figure. I am a, a great admirer of him. And I think that what I think Wittgenstein really achieved in his later philosophy was he, he, he was, I see him as in the same tradition as people like Hume and Aristotle in a way, who were resistant to the idea that the most important things in life could ever be entirely nailed down or captured in formulas and algorithms and that the very language we use you know is is not this precise logical tool that philosophers think it is it's something which has ambiguity and is defined by its use so i think wittgenstein is one of those philosophers you know there are philosophers who try and sort of uh, lift it up to the stars and there are those who bring it down to earth in the right way and i think he brought philosophy down to earth in lots of important ways i recommend his book on uncertainty a very good short book uh one to have by the bedside uh, uh definitely there uh hongbo is asking another very easy question which is in the light of the development of ai uh, will humans, um, if I've understood you correctly, Hongbo, uh, will humans uh, and uh, uh, machines blend? Well, I mean, in the sense... Are you, worried, would, are you worried about that? Am I worried about it? I, I, I probably should be more than I am. I find it very hard to... I mean, you, you, there are these people who are the techno either optimists or techno fatalists who kind of like think that within a short period of time, humanity is going to be transformed or exterminated and i don't know perhaps have a somewhat complacent view that we're a bit more attached to our human nature than these people think and that there's going to be enhancement there's going to be the news there's going to be implants and stuff like that but are we going to voluntarily give up our fundamental humanity i mean i will can't we have a choice say, will we have a choice we have a choice. We have a choice, indeed. Is that we do have a choice? These things will be a result of decisions. We're not going to be, uh, you know, uh, abducted by aliens and forced to live in ecto suits or exosuits or something. <laughs> I, so I think philosophy, to conclude, um, it is a really great subject and should be at the heart of every school. And uh, and when I was in schools. Uh, I first met Julian when he came in as philosopher in residence to try and implant it. I'd love to see it grow at, at Buckingham um, and, and in other universities as a core part of every undergraduate's experience in, in how to think and how to understand the world and how to understand ourselves. Um, uh, before I thank Julian, can I mention tomorrow night Paul Johnson uh, on the economy and then next week uh, Robert Skidelsky Keynes's uh, biographer Katia Adler of BBC talking about um, the future of, of the Brexit and, and the EU, Max Hastings uh, talking about Churchill. Um, so, uh, but Julian, that was absolutely riveting. Um, we had a thousand plus people uh, listening to you. Thank you all of you. Uh, for those listening in, do uh, uh, log in, do, do let people know about Julian's work, do visit Julian's uh, website. 
um, uh, do uh, uh, look look into other talks and spread the information, uh, tweet about the talks so that other people can come in. Uh, but Julian, you, you um, you've absolutely uh, passed on explaining and making philosophy not just understandable, but so attractive and compelling uh, 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 to people. If you can do that over this technology, think what we could do if we were in the room with you. And I'm sure that you will go on and make that mark, perhaps by um, harmonizing and being the person who brings together um, uh, it with the three um, uh, cautions you had at the beginning, um, uh, philosophies uh, uh, from around the world uh, as we come into the 21st century. Uh, that is what you'll get the Nobel Prize for philosophy in. Um, Julian Beguini, thank you so much from all of us. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you for everyone for tuning in. Appreciate it. Thank you.